So there I was, minding my own business, brushing up on the old speeds and feeds, when I hear the whir of a heavy vehicle outside, followed by an unexpected commotion. Curiosity peaked, I ran out to see what was going on. Turns out my next project had just arrived, albeit a little damaged. I walked out to the delivery driver scrambling out of a ditch, struggling with an awkward, heavy, and now damaged box. The 50-pound bar of steel had a bit more momentum than the poor guy anticipated, sending it sailing out the side door as he rounded the bend. Usually we have to wait until the middle of a project for chaos to commence. Let's just hope the rest of the build doesn't go this way. Every time I make something on the lathe, I'm sucked into a never-ending game of musical tool holders. I have many more cutting tools that I use on a regular basis than I do holders to mount them in, and I've grown tired of constantly swapping them out. So I'm going to make some more. I think six of the basic style holders should cover my needs. The first step, as you might expect, is to put together a design. I'll be copying these Alora's type CXA tool holders mostly dimension for dimension. And I say mostly because a 1.5 inch by 5 inch stock I bought is just slightly under the thickness of the originals. And also just slightly over the width. So I'll be using the major dimensions of the stock since the outside dimensions aren't really that important anyway. It really just needs to hold a tool. The actual important part of the design is the precision ground dovetail. I imagine this feature is precision ground as a means to maintain position repeatability when exchanged on the tool post. But also to increase the rigidity of the setup. The holder engages with the tool post on the back face and the slanted face of the dovetail. If the theoretical corners of each side of the dovetail aren't parallel, the holder will have a tendency to rock under load. But I can't directly measure between these corners to know the correct inside distance. To figure this out, I'll have to take two measurements. First, the distance between a pair of pins, in my case end mill shanks, placed against the slanted faces. Then the face-to-face -face distance between the back and recessed faces. When I cut the dovetails on the new holders, I'll just replicate these measurements rather than calculate where the corners actually are. One of the strange things I discovered about these holders I'm copying is that while nearly all the dimensions appear to be imperial, all the hardware is metric. This probably has something to do with the holders being made overseas, but nevertheless I'll be replicating the metric hardware in the new holders in the event that I need them to be interchangeable for some reason. Gotta love mixing metric and imperial. Now the design is pretty simple, so I think I'll be daring and try to make do with the chicken scratch I left on the notepad. But Brandon, you always make a drawing. Well, apparently not. Will it backfire? Only one way to find out. Now let's make these things. I'll start with the six block bodies. There's a decent amount of work that I can do on all six at once, so rather than cut six pieces to length, I'll cut one piece long enough for all six, plus a little wiggle room for future cuts and finishing. Like I mentioned before, the geometry of the dovetail is pretty important. I intend to surface grind the angled faces to ensure that the corners of the dovetail remain parallel. But because I'll need to grind each side independently, the opposite faces I'll be referencing will need to be parallel as well. So a little pre-grinding is in order. Starting with the large faces, you can see just how out of whack the steel is straight from the mill. Barreling off the delivery truck probably didn't help much either. With face 1 cleared, I'll flip this over and grind the opposite face parallel to the first the same way. Then from here I can stain the stock up on edge and grind that flat as well. Before grinding the final face, I'll take this over to the surface plate just to get an idea of how square these three faces are and whether I'll need to correct them. Setting the surface gauge up as a squareness comparator, I'll zero on one face and then note the difference on the opposite side. The tilt ends up being half the difference between the two sides. In my case about 5 ten thousandths over 4 inches. While this is correctable, it's also close enough for what I need. So I'll set this back up in the surface grinder and finish the final face. Remember the important part of these grinding operations is that the opposite faces are parallel. A quick sweep with the surface gauge tells me I'm within a ten thousandth across the whole part. Mission accomplished. Now I could go straight to setting this up on the mill and making chips, but all that effort grinding would be wasted if my mill is not set up correctly. And you know what that means. I'm going to take a few pointers from viewers and simplify my table setup. For starters, I'm going to get this rotary table out of the way. 
Not only will this give me some breathing room, but at 200 pounds, yes, 200 pounds, it can cause the table to bow under its sheer mass. The next tip I got was to remove the vise from its rotary base. Mounting right to the table makes the whole setup a lot more rigid for a multitude of reasons. And honestly, in 8 months of machining, I've used the swivel base a grand total of one time. So this is a no-brainer. Now of course I have to tram the vise to the mill, so I'll indicate that end before cinching it down. And for good measure, check that the vise faces are parallel to the X and Y axes of the mill. While I haven't adjusted the mill head off vertical recently, it never hurts to check this alignment as well. So I'll mount my trusty tenths indicator in the spindle and sweep it around on the vise surfaces that I just checked. And luckily no adjustment is needed. Awesome. With full confidence in the machine, I'll turn my attention back to the material. My next step is to mill the dovetails. This is the largest single piece of material I've worked with to date, so I'm taking extra time to make sure it's set up correctly. While I do have this resting on a set of parallels, the vise is only supporting the middle third of the material. To make sure it's actually horizontal, I'll set up the indicator once again and sweep across the top face of the part. This setup also leaves significant cantilevered sections on each side of the vise that need a little support. I'll push up on each end with machinist jacks while using an indicator to check that I'm not deflecting the material upward out of alignment. With zeros reading literally everywhere, I'm finally ready to make some friggin' chips. I've got a lot of material to hog out in the middle before I can start with the dovetail cutter, so to make quick work of this I'll be using a roughing mill. I start with a fairly mild depth of cut just to test the rigidity of the setup. But I quickly learned that this cutter loves deep passes. Watching this thing churn its way right through the steel like butter is super satisfying. Since the depth will be important for measuring the dovetail, I left about 5 thou for a final pass later. After roughing away most of the channel, I'll switch to a finishing end mill to get the final width. This last cut technically removes the outside corner of the dovetails, giving the clearance for the tool post mechanism. But there's also an additional chamfer on the top side. I'll switch to an indexable chamfer mill and cut this here as well. Now for the fun stuff, the dovetail cutter. This is a first for me, so I'm interested to see how well or not well this will work. I'll start with a fairly modest depth of cut and start working my way back and forth taking passes along each side. One thing I notice is the deeper I go, the noisier the tool gets. I imagine this has to do with the variable cutter diameter. What's an appropriate cutting speed at the larger diameter tip is too slow for the smaller diameter near the top. But there isn't really a way around this problem, so I'll just have to make small adjustments to the table feed to keep the chatter to a minimum. As I get close to the final dimension, I start measuring the dovetail with the methods from before. The width is coming out surprisingly consistent along the length, well within a thousandth. But the depth is a different story. It appears the middle area is about three to four thousandths deeper than on the ends. This can only mean two things. Either the mill's ways are bowed or loose, or the material has shifted in its setup. Since I don't even want to think about the ramifications of the former, I'm going to cross my fingers that the indicator reveals the material has moved. Shoo, that's a relief. It basically lines up with the three to four thousandths I was seeing in the depth. The bar is still well seated against the parallels, so I'll make some small adjustments with the machinist jacks on each end bringing the material back up flat. A sweep of the top face shows me that that worked and the material reads zero once again. With that little alignment problem squared away, I'll start by taking light passes getting closer and closer to the final dimensions, checking the measurements along the way. Now my plan was to leave a little material here on the depth and width for finishing on the surface grinder, but I've since discovered a couple problems. First, I just realized that the extra grinding wheel arbors I have are missing parts. So I won't be able to mount and dress a dedicated 60 degree grinding wheel to do the job. Second, and more obnoxiously, the big bulky wheel shroud around the grinder doesn't give me near the clearance to hold my parts at the necessary 60 degree angle. I could go down a whole side project rabbit hole to solve these problems, but honestly, when looking at the results of the dovetail cutter, I'm decently impressed with the finish it's leaving. And the parallelism is within a few tenths along the whole length. Shrink that to the length of the single tool holder, and I'm near what I would have achieved on the grinder anyways. Looks like all that extra effort I went through preparing the bar and setting it up on the mill just saved me a whole bunch of extra work. I'll go ahead and remove the remaining material on the width and depth and bring this to the final dimensions. After thinking it over and verifying I've done absolutely everything I can from this angle, I'll dismount the bar. The remaining features will need to be done individually, so I'll mark out six equal lengths and then cut these up on the bandsaw. Obviously the bandsaw has left two unfinished faces, so the first step from here is to clean and square these up. 
I'll take care of the first face with a side milling operation that brings it square to the other four. I can then position the block resting on the face I just cut and face mill the top square into length. With all six blocks cut down to their final outside dimensions, I can start on the finer details. For one, I want to chamfer all the outside edges. Of course I could do this with a file, but it would be far more efficient and consistent to run these under a chamfer mill. I'll set up the mill to cut a 25 thou chamfer along the fixed jaw of the vise. Then I can just start working my way through the blocks edge by edge without having to indicate the setup on every part. Doesn't that look nice? Next I can start hogging out the pocket that makes the tool holder a tool holder. I'll remove most of the material with a roughing mill like before, taking a couple passes through what will be the middle of the pocket. Then switch to a finishing mill to cut the bottom and sides to dimension. This of course leaves a whole new set of edges that need to be chamfered, so I'll set up the cutter again on the mill and make quick work of these as well. For all the less accessible edges I'll have to revert to manually filing. I happen to have a triangular file that is perfect for reaching into the 60 degree corners of the dovetail. And a standard flat file takes care of the remaining edges around the tool pocket ends. The final bit of machining on these blocks are the threaded holes for the clamping screws and height adjustment post. To save myself the effort of redefining the origin as I switch from one block to the next, this vice stop gives me a positive location to position the material against. This allows me to zero on the corner this one and only time for all the remaining operations. I'll start with the clamping screw holes. After first center drilling and pre-drilling to the appropriate size for an M12 by 1.75 tap, I'll drop a chamfer on here slightly larger than 12 millimeters, and while I'm at it, set the quill stop so I can quickly and consistently chamfer all the later holes. Mounting the tap in the drill chuck, I can then power tap right on through. Then just repeat the steps for the remaining three holes. The final hole to take care of is for the height adjustment stud. This is a blind M12 by 1.25 hole. So this time around I'm using a bottoming tap to get fully formed threads as far down in the hole as possible. I'll get the tap started straight with the drill chuck and the mill in neutral, then switch to a tap wrench to take it the rest of the way so I can feel when I've reached the bottom. This actually takes a couple passes since the chips end up building up in the bottom of the hole preventing the tap from going all the way. After repeating that process five more times, and without a single hiccup I might add, all six blocks are complete. I do have a small amount of finishing that I want to do later, but first I want to knock out all the height adjustment hardware. Similar to how I prepared a piece of material to cut the six holders from, I'll do the same for the knurled adjustment knobs. This is a pretty substantial amount of stick out from the chuck, so I'll first face and center drill the ends so I can bring a live center in for extra support. Then turn down the outside diameter long enough to make six knobs from, while also accounting for the parting blade thickness and clearance for the knurling tool itself. Switching to the knurling tool, I'll set the height by pressing it against the diameter before locking the tool post, and then power feed my way across the length, stopping periodically to verify the pattern is staying consistent, and even more importantly, grippy. For the knobs to work smoothly, it's important for the thread axis to be square to the knob faces. So rather than thread each knob individually, I'll tap them all at once right in this setup. And just to be safe, I'll manually drive the tap with the tap wrench. The knurled edge, while nice and grippy, is bordering on dangerous. So before parting the first knob, I'll turn a slight chamfer on here. Then switch to the parting blade to cut the first knob from the stock. And I think you gather how the rest were made. I still have the opposite faces to clean up, but I have a plan for those, so hold tight. To make the M12 height adjustment studs, I came up with a very clever way to knock them out quickly. A pre-machined 12mm rod of 4140 and an M12 by 1.25 die. Because the shaft is already at the thread diameter, I'll save myself a ton of time I would have spent turning down a larger piece of stock. I'll get this set up in the collet chuck of the lathe, and go ahead and file the final radius on what will make up the top of the stud, which should also help with the threading. I'll mount the die in a holder, and then apply pressure with the face of the tailstock chuck to get the die started out straight and then start working my way down the length. Before I could finish the job though, I hit the gripping capacity of the collet chuck, so I had to switch to the three jaw. I should have just left this on here in the first place. That's a lot better. Or is it? That thread came out obnoxiously wonky. Heck, it looks like there's barely anything left in this section. I ran into this problem once before threading a much smaller shaft with a die, but I assumed it wouldn't be a problem for this larger diameter. 
I've seen folks make tailstock die holders to help keep the dies straight, but it's crunch time for this project, so that will have to wait for another time. Instead, I'll have to single point thread these shafts one at a time. I've done several segments on turning threads, so I'll just mention a key point for this setup. These threads are metric, but the lead screw on my machine is imperial, so the thread dial is for the most part useless. Ask me how I know. To get around this, I have to keep the thread feed engaged the entire time and reverse the lathe between each cutting pass. After verifying I'm cutting the correct pitch, I can proceed with taking the passes, stopping and reversing the spindle after each. I should mention that technically you can disengage the feed as long as you stop the spindle and then run it in reverse. You just have to make sure to pick back up on the exact same mark in the thread dial without letting it go all the way around. This can be especially helpful when there's a tight stopping area. But in the case of my setup, I have the space, so I'm just going to leave it engaged. Once I verify the fit with the other knobs, I'll part this off and what do you know, the other five are already complete and waiting. I still have some work to do on these, but first I'm going to jump back to finishing the knobs I started earlier. I know, I know, I'm all over the place. With the lathe still set up for thread turning, I'll make a short thread to stub to match the knobs. Then I can mount the stud a little bit further in on the chuck, and screw the threaded knobs right against the chuck jaws, leaving the unfinished side exposed for machining. I'll face the knob to its final thickness, chamfer the outside edge, and do the same on the inside edge with a countersinking bit in the tailstock. Repeat that five more times and that takes care of all six knobs. Now I'm going to change gears just one last time and go and finish the threaded studs. I need a way to hold them without damaging the thread, so I'll quickly face and tap a slug of aluminum. With this, I can screw in one of the studs and use a pair of jam nuts to lock it in place. On the top end, I'll file a decorative radius like my original attempt, then flip the stud end for end and turn down a short section of threads on the end. This is needed to give clearance for the unformed threads at the bottom of the blind hole in the tool holder. And just like that, all the parts are made. I do plan to cold blue these, but first I can't resist assembling one to see how it works. Since the height stud has no integrated drive mechanism, I have to use a pair of nuts wedged together to tighten it in place. Then I can remove these and thread on the knob and locking nut. It just now occurred to me that I completely forgot to order the wave washers that go between these, so I'll snag one from one of the other tool holders for now. I did remember to order the set screws though, so I'll drive them in and lock them down on a tool. Now for the moment of truth, how does it fit on the tool post? The height adjustment is very smooth. And even better, the locking handle stops at the same position as the other tool holders. Exactly like I planned. Now the true test is the rigidity, so let's take a nice beefy cut on some scrap steel. Rock solid. That's about as good as I could have hoped for. Seeing this on here assembled, the bare steel color is actually kind of growing on me. They really stand out from the other import tool holders. All in all, I think this project has been one of my more successful ones. Not too many unexpected problems, a couple new operations checked off, and just one side project on the scoreboard. I expect these holders will see a serious amount of use, and I'm excited to actually be able to rapidly change tools like the quick change tool post design is intended. Now I just have to find a good place to put all of these. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.